Hey everybody, it's Pastor Brian Ross from Grace Life Bible Church in Grand Rapids, Michigan. We want to welcome you to this uh, midweek video. Appreciate you tuning in, and as always, if you haven't already done so, if you would consider subscribing and ringing the alarm bell as a way to stay current with the ministry. We go live from our assembly building on Sunday morning, as well as when we create content for you here midweek. We would certainly appreciate that. Um, we we'll also want to remind you about our Rumble channel here, Grace Life Bible Church on Rumble. We established this as an alt text site. Should something happen to our YouTube ministry, so if you're into alt text sites or would like an alternative to YouTube, please consider checking us out and joining us here on Rumble as well. My featured book this week is my book, The King James Bible in America, an orthographic, historical, and textual investigation. Uh, this book covers issues related to the printed history of the text in the United States, as well as some discussion of uh, different words, uh, pairs of words, always, always, thoroughly, thoroughly, etc., that often get debated and discussed um, in questions related to the King James Bible. So if you are interested in the history of the text in the United States, as well as uh, other issues related to orthography and, and uh, et cetera, please consider picking up a copy of that book as a way of supporting the ministry. Last week, I did a video on this book, The Legacy of the King James Bible. Uh, this was done celebrating the 400 years of the most influential English translation. This was published by Leland Rankin in 2011 uh, as part of the 400th anniversary of the King James Bible. And I mentioned in that video that uh, there was a host of books that came out that year related to the 400th anniversary of the King James Bible. Uh, I have some of them here at home with me. Others are spread around in a couple other locations so I don't, I don't have all the material uh, in front of me. But as I did that lesson from this video from last week, I got to thinking about a message that I preached in the year 2011. So here are my notes. This is from Sunday, May 29, 2011 at the Great Lakes Grace Bible Conference on the language and readability of the King James Bible, which I used a lot of material from Leland Rankin's book. And I thought I would scour the internet and see if I could locate a recording of that video, and I have been able to do that. So my purpose here is to kind of put this introduction on a, an older video. Uh, this video I preached, sorry, the, the message in the video I preached on May 29, 2011. And here was the purpose statement that was given to me. I was supposed to cover the language of the King James, and archaic words are actually helpful. And the King James is easier to read than modern translations, and the Old English is pure and precise. The language of the King James is an advantage. That's what I was tasked with doing back in 2011, so some 12 years ago. Okay, uh, So this, this, these are the notes. I'll put a link to these notes in the description. Now, I, I must say, you know, in the last 12 years, there are a few things that I said in this video that I might see a little bit different now. But on the whole, I thought this is an interesting video related to the majestic nature of the King James language and why that language, and, and, and that's a, a topic and a subject matter that some people find interesting. So I'm commending this video to you. Please note that I have uh, the recording that I found had something at the end of it and some like congregational singing and stuff on the front of it. I've tried to trim all that stuff off of this video so that that's not here. And I commend you now to check out my video from um, May 29, 2011 on the language and readability of the King James Bible. If you like this video, please leave a comment, like it, subscribe to our channel, share this video on social media. Again, this is from 12 years ago. Might be some things in here I might state a little different, but on the whole, I think this video will be worth your time. This morning, my topic, now I've got to be honest with you, when I heard that every conference for the whole year was going to be on the King James. I kind of was like, man, aren't people going to get like burned out on that? And so I, I'll be honest, I sort of had a bit of a bad attitude about it at first, but as I got assignments and I started studying, I, I don't think it's long enough to cover. It, there's no way that you can cover everything that there is to cover regarding the King James Bible. And this morning, my topic is an interesting topic. It's the language and readability of the King James Bible. It's what I've been given to do is to talk about the language of the KJV, and archaic words are actually helpful. The KJV is easier to read than modern translations, and Old English is pure and precise, and the language of the KJV is an advantage. To get started, I'd like to share with you uh, something from the introduction 
of Alistair McGrath's book on the King James Bible. It's called In the Beginning. Okay, I just want to read this to you. Just listen to this for a few minutes. It says, The two greatest influences on the shaping of the English language are the works of William Shakespeare and the English translation of the Bible that appeared in 1611. The King James Bible, named for the King of England, who ordered the, produ the production of a fresh translation in 1604, is both a religious and literary classic. Literary scholars have heaped praise upon it. 19th century writers and literary cr critics acclaimed it as the noblest momentum of English prose. It is a series, in a series of lectures at Cambridge University during the First w World War, Sir Arthur uh, Couch declared that the King James was the very greatest literary achievement in the English language. The only possible challenger for this title came from the complete works of William Shakespeare, and his audience had no quarrel with that judgment. The King James Bible was a landmark in the history of the English language. Okay? And it, uh, and it had an inspiration on poets, dramatists, artists, politicians. The influence of this work has been incalculable, and for many years it was the only English translation of the Bible available. Without the King James Bible, there would have been no Paradise Lost, no Pilgrim's Progress, no Handel's Messiah, no Negro Spirituals, no Gettysburg Address. These are there are innumerable other works were inspired by the language of the King James Bible, and without this Bible, the culture of English of the English speaking world would have been immeasurably impoverished. And the King James Bible played no small part in the shaping of English literary tradition, nationalism, and by asserting the supremacy of the English language as a means of conveying religious truth. That's high praise. Okay, that's high praise. What you have in your hand, folks, is not just God's word for English-speaking people. It is a literary masterpiece. Okay, it is it is the pinnacle. It is the summit of things that have been written in English. Now, this message is going to be slightly different because I want to take you through some things about the history of the English language and demonstrate to you how the King James Bible is the, it is the ultimate summit or pinnacle in written English prose and why you should respect it as such. Okay? Just a few more things. The King James Bible became part of the everyday world of generations of English-speaking people across the world. It can be argued that until the end of the First World War, the King James Bible was seen not simply as the most important English translation of the Bible, but as one of the finest literary works of English literature. It did not follow literary trends, it set them. Okay? Until very recently, the KJV was the world's best-selling Bible in English. And sometime in the 1980s, it was supplanted by the New International Version which remains tops today. Still, listen to this, there are more than one billion English-speaking people in the world today. Okay? And there are at least two King James Bibles in existence for every one of them. That's how many, that is how widely circulated, how widely read and printed the King James Bible has been in history. Come with me if you would to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. I want to share with you the text that I was given to... Um, Try to organize this information around. Second Corinthians uh, chapter three. Second Corinthians chapter three. Verse verse twelve. It says, "Seeing that we have such a hope, we use great plainness of speech." You know, many in our day have attacked the King James Bible. This has been been mentioned already, but. They, and the attack is, that's archaic. That's old. No one talks like that anymore. That's hard to understand. The these and the vows and, you know, you've heard all that sort of thing before. And, and you know, it's, it, they, they, they make out like, you know, you can't, like it's another language almost. That you can't read it as an English speaking person and understand it because it's really some foreign nebulous language that no one is aware of. And I say that's just silly. Okay, you can read it, and you can understand it. And you know what? The, the thing about the King James Bible that it is, is unique is that it promotes, it forces you to study. Okay, It's going to force you to study because there are going to be words, there are going to be things in it that, are, that you're going to have to look up. 
But that's what study is about, right? There, and, and so that, that is an interesting facet. Two issues that are commonly cited about the use of the KJV in, in modern uh, usage is, well, you know, the these and the vows, the thy, ye, the use of the extended verb endings, all of these things, people can't understand them. In the same context, look at verse 10. For even that which was made glorious had no glory in this respect by reason of the glory that what? Excelleth. You see that says excelleth? That's an old that's an old verb ending. Okay? Do you talk like that today? If you if I'm gonna stand up here and just talk to you about something excelling, I would not say or I would probably not use the word excelling. Right? But there it is. Look at another one. Say, uh, verse 11. Look at verse 11. Uh, For if that which was done away was glorious, much more that which remaineth is what? Glorious. So people will criticize the King James for these types of things. Look at verse 14. But their minds were blinded, for until this day remaineth the same veil un untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. You see in that verse 14 it says remaineth. Okay? So people are going to criticize, and they do routinely, the King James Bible, for its use of, of thee, thou, ye. Come with me, if you would, to John chapter 3. This is a classic um, mid-ex, John chapter 3, example of why, of why you want to use the King James Bible, because it's dispensationally uh, significant. But this old English, folks, yes, we may not talk like that today in common usage, but when they wrote the, when they translated the Word of God, one of the interesting things to consider is that a lot of these forms that the King James translators adopted were already going out of common use when they made the translation. Okay? But I'm going to demonstrate to you, hopefully, throughout this message, of why they made that choice to use those older forms, even though they were already going out of common usage when they made the translation. John chapter 3, if you would. This is the story of Jesus here and Nicodemus. And for the sake of time, go to verse 5. It says, Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto who? Thee. Now when he says thee, who is he talking to? Nicodemus. Nicodemus. Except a man be born of water and of spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Drop down at verse 6. That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of spirit is spirit. Now look at verse 7. Marvel not, I say unto thee, Nicodemus, ye must be born again. Now you notice, when he says ye, who is he now referring to? He's referring to Nicodemus and the rest of what? Of Israel. Okay? So the old English form is more precise because Jesus is not just talking to Nicodemus there. He's What he's saying to Nicodemus is in, is in reference and applicable to the entire nation of what? Of Israel. Okay? Now a modern translation is going to change that to you. There, they, if that's what you, if you translate it to you, or change it to you, the precision is lost, and the modern reader is going to think that he's only talking to who? Nicodemus. So these old forms, these nuances are lost in modern translations, and the, 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 the old English is actually way more precise than what would be in a modern translation. Now, the publishers, folks, of modern versions want you to believe that the King James Bible is hard to understand and hard to read. Right? You've heard that before. I've been in the, the bookstore and looked at these charts of, you know, about the reading, so-called reading level of each translation. I want you to look at this chart here. Okay? According to uh, Felch Kincaid read, uh, readability scores, people have, linguists have studied these things. And I want you to look, the, the, the reading level of Genesis chapter 1 grades out at a 4th grade reading level. Okay? The NIV, a 5th grade, the New, uh, New American Standard, a, 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 almost a 5th grade, and so on. But of all of those, which is the lowest? <laughs> Go all the way to the bottom then, and look at the overall grade level for each one of those translations. And the lowest reading level is 5.8 as a King James Bible. 
So the linguists who are experts in these things have analyzed these texts, and they have concluded that the King James Bible is actually easier to read in the Old English there, in the English of the day there, than what is published in a modern Bible today. Okay? Now there are some reasons for that. The Bible is easier to read because it uses one or two syllable words, while modern or new versions substitute complex multi-syllable words or phrases. Okay? So the in, in the language of the King James Bible, Gail Ripplinger deals with this, and she cites statistics generated by grammatique and word from windows to demonstrate that the King James Bible has a fifth grade reading level. Okay? A fifth grade reading level. While the New King James and the New American Standard Bible read at a sixth grade level, and the popular NIV is actually harder yet to read than those, it grades out at an eighth grade reading level. And the reason for that is the King James Bible possesses uh, less syllables per word, Less letters per word, less words per sentence, smaller percentage of longer words, and greater percentage of short words than modern versions. So if you take all those things into account, the experts in these things will tell you that the King James Bible is actually the easiest one to read. You know, how did children in this country used to learn to read? In the only book the family had was a what? Bible. Was a Bible. When they went to school and they called roll, the child would answer the roll call by standing up and quoting a scripture verse. Okay? So this whole idea now that this is so nebulous and so foreign that, you know, a sixth grade kid can't understand it is absolutely ridiculous because for almost 400 years... The, the better part of the 400 years between the time when the King James first appeared and, and where we are now, this was the common Bible. This was the Bible every family had. And most children in this country and English children around the world learned to read from a King James Bible. Okay? So one of the most interesting aspects, and I've already alluded to it, of the King James Bible is that it used ways of speaking that were already becoming archaic in, the, in standard English in the early 17th century. There are a couple of questions that I'd like to try to look at, if, if time permits, this morning. Why, first of all, would be, why would the King James translators knowingly use words and forms, these words and forms when translating, if they knew they were going out of usage? And second, what was the impact of their decisions upon the English language? Okay? Now, I want to go through a brief history of the English language with you, okay? And, you know, this is sort of right up my alley as a history teacher, so hopefully I'm not going to bore you to tears with this, but I, you cannot understand the supremacy and the influence and the impact of this King James Bible if you don't understand how it is the culmination of a long historical process in the evolution of the English language, okay? There are three distinct periods, folks, in the development of English. And English is an interesting uh, language because it develops relatively quickly compared to other languages. Greek, for example, evolves and it emerges over about roughly a thousand year period. English is going to come into existence. The English of the King James Bible is going to come into existence through a much shorter process than that. And there are three distinct time periods in the in the. Uh, History and the development of English. The first one is Old English, and that lasts from about the 6th century to the Norman conquest of England in 1066. Then you enter into a Middle English period, which lasts from about 1100 to 1500, and then Modern English from about 1500 to the present. Okay? Now, when the Romans landed, folks, on England, when, they, when, when the Romans landed on England uh, a few years before the birth of Christ, English as a language did not exist. Okay? When the Romans first show up in Britain, uh, uh, shortly before the birth of Christ, there is no such thing as an English language. The language at that time and place included both Germanic and Celtic elements, okay? And it was not until the 6th century that a small percentage of people in Britain began to speak a prototype of what we would recognize as English, okay? 
Now, during that time period, from the 6th century until the Norman Conquest, the French Conquest of, of England in 1066, Britain was in a series, was tossed about by a series of invasions. Okay? Um, for example, the German tribes, the Angles, the Saxons, the Jutes, uh, the Scots, all these people are, are coming through there, and as they come through there, various pieces of their languages are all being taken and beginning to be formed into a, into a new language. Okay? Um, it, that, that, this is happening there. The Catholics, Pope Gregory, viewed these guys in Britain as just a bunch of uh, pagan island dwellers. So he sends, he sends a, uh, a Catholic missionary named Constantine, not Constantine the Great of the Council of Nicaea. This is a different Constantine. But he sends him up there. And the end result of that is when the Catholics show up in England, they are bringing Latin with them, and they're bringing some, some Greek with them. And so that Latin language and a little bit of Greek is now going to begin to mix with all of these other dialects and so forth that are being, that are, that are being uh, brought from all these regions to the island. And as these things mix, you start to see the development of language. So over the course of... Of about a thousand years, these combined cultural forces created a hybrid language that assimilated elements of Roman, Saxon, Danish, and Norman into a new strain of English. Okay? Look, the politics of invasion also affect the culture. And when they affect the culture, they also affect the language. Okay? You know, how is it that you're able to understand me this morning? Because I'm speaking your language, okay? So when that stuff happens, the languages themselves are going to be affected. Then the Vikings are going to come, and from 750 to 1050, they're going to impact Old English, and so you're going to have Old Norse terminologies and words being introduced into the language, okay? So the English language, then, is going to enter into what is... So that's all sort of a summary, quick summary of Old English. Look, I, look at... These are my notes. I'm just telling you the high points because I have ten pages. Okay? We're never going to get finished, but I don't know. Oh, by the way, all my... I checked this morning. All the notes for the entire weekend have been uploaded to my website by the webmaster. Okay? So they're already there if you want to look at them. And I would suggest that you read this one in particular. Now, what, in, 10, in 1066, the Normans invade. Or the French, all right? How many of you have ever heard of the uh, Bayou Tapestry? The Bordeaux Tapestry, you ever heard of that? About the, 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 the Norman invasion? Fascinating. Go on YouTube and, and, and enter in Bordeaux Tapestry, and somebody has taken the Bordeaux Tapestry and animated it. So you, it'll take you through and show you the entire story of the Norman Conquest as they've animated the Bordeaux Tapestry, okay? But what's the significance? When that happens, the French come and they introduce French into the, into the language of, of Britain. So the Norman Conquest then is going to lead to a Middle English period that is going to be dominated by French. Okay? The widespread perception was that French had established itself as the main language of the cultural elite of Europe, inevitably led English to somewhat uh, the perception that English was a crude language um, and incapable of conveying the subtle undertones necessary for diplomacy. So English falls on hard times during the Middle English period because of the Norman conquest and invasion of the island, and French is viewed as the scholarly diplomatic language of the day, and therefore a lot of people are going to suppress, there's going to be a move to, to sort of suppress English um, on the island. Uh, that, I, things like the fine distinctions of philosophy, theology, legal terms, finance, are viewed as not adequately communicated through English. So French is going to have a predominance even, uh, e even in England during this, time, this Middle English time period. And it was during that Middle English time period that John Wycliffe began the process of translating the Bible into the vernacular English, okay? During, during the Middle English time period. I want to quote a quote here for you. In 1401, a debate over the use of English in church life ensued at Oxford, and in 1407, Thomas Andro, Bishop of Canterbury, issued the following statement. 
We therefore legislate and ordain that nobody shall from this day forth translate any text of the Holy Scripture on his own authority into English. Or any other language, whether in the form of a book, pamphlet, or tract, and that any such book, pamphlet, or tract, whether complete, whether composed recently or in the time of John Wycliffe or in the future, shall not be read in part, in whole, in public, or in private. Now that is a, there's two things going on there. Number one, you have the Catholic Church that doesn't want the Word of God in the vernacular language. Okay? But there's also a perception at that time that English is, as a language is incapable of communicating the truth of the Word of God. Okay? So English then became the language of the religious underground. Okay? I'm serious. So the, the Lollers, the followers of John Wycliffe then, are going to be persecuted by the Catholics for owning, possessing, or distributing an English Bible. Okay? Now, what changes that? How many have ever heard of the Hundred Years' War? The Hundred Years' War is a war between France and England. Okay? And during the Hundred Years' War, as the English are fighting the French, they start to scratch their heads and say, uh... Why are we speaking the language of our enemy anyway? And so there starts to be a move then away from France, away from French, to and, and then a wider acceptance of English as a legitimate diplomatic, legal, and academic language. And people are beginning to have more confidence in the English language as a means of expressing the theological truths of the Bible. Okay? Now. So the Hundred Years' War, when English wins, it's going, when, when England wins the Hundred Years' War, the language is going to be viewed differently. No longer was English dismissed as the language of the lower class. It was now the language of choice in a nation with an increasing sense of national identity, shared purpose, strengthened by England's growing maritime enterprise. The story of the King James Bible, folks, cannot be told without an understanding of the remarkable rise of confidence in the English language in the late 16th century. What was once scorned as a barbarous language of plowmen became the language of patriots and poets, a language fit for heroes on the one hand and the riches of the Bible on the other. Gone were any hesitations about the merits of the English language as Elizabeth's navy and armies defeated the Armada and established England military, England's military credentials, her poets, playwrights, and translators had propelled English into the front rank of living European languages. Okay? And the King James Bible consolidated the enormous, advantage, enormous advantages in the English language over the centuries and can be seen as the symbol of a nation and language that believed that their moment had arrived. Okay? If you look at England as a nation, and when the King James Bible is translated, that Bible is translated as England is reaching a summit in the, in the history of the world in their power. King James founds Jamestown. He sends the guys over. That's why they call it Jamestown. Okay? So England has defeated the Armada. Elizabeth has been king or queen. Shakespeare is writing. And the language, the entire culture, the entire history of Britain is moving to a caught to a climax, to a pinnacle. And the King James Bible is going to be the summit of that for the English language. Okay? Hopefully you're understanding what I'm saying. In 1589. So not long before the commission to translate the King James Bible, the art of Poe, of prosy, was written at the height of the Elizabeth, Elizabethan age, and George Putnam declared that English was just as sophisticated as Greek or Latin, and perfectly capable of expressing the full range of human emotions and thoughts. And then he says, to write in English... Or translate in English, it became a political act, affirming the intrinsic dignity of the language and a newly confident people and nation. Why shouldn't they have a Bible in their own language? 
Now, I want to talk to you next about the age of Shakespeare, James, and the translators. So now we're into the modern English time period. How many have heard of Henry VIII? Okay. Henry VIII wants a male son. He's not able to uh, get one, so he petitions the Pope to annul his marriage. The Pope refuses to do so, and he then is going to break with the church and form the Church of England. Okay? And who's the head of the Church of England? He is. He is. Isn't that nice? Okay? It's nice to be able to do that, make the church. So he does that. And Catholicism is going to fall off the scene then in England. Now, I'm not, I'm, I'm not pro-Catholic, and, and you know that, but there's a, the, the pageantry of the Mass. If you went to a Mass, was there pomp and circumstance and regalness and all sorts of, what was it, was it, it, was it thrilling to the people to go there and watch that? Okay? So in England then, when that was gone, there was a void left in the culture. Okay? And what is it in England that has stepped up to fill that void? The theater. The, the Shakespearean theater. The first theater, in 1576, James uh, Burge built the first theater in London that had not seen a theater in town in more than a thousand years since the Roman occupation. When the people lost the pageantry of the Roman Catholic Church, there was this void there, and it was filled by the rise of the theater. The pulpit was exchanged for a stage, and the language of plays was reminiscent of the high tone of the mass. It was, after all, a listening culture, a culture of word, a peculiarly English occupation. I want you to think about it. What is, how many know what the Renaissance was? Okay. More than you know about that than the uh, French Revolution yesterday, so that's good. <laughs> the Renaissance, when you think of the English Renaissance, you don't have painters like Michelangelo. You don't have painters like you have on continental Europe. What was it that encapsulated the English Renaissance? It was the play. It was the spoken one. Words. It should be little wonder, folks, that English became the educated language of the civilized world. Think about it right now. England dominates film, music, literature, and the dramatic arts. <clears throat> the English imagination was and remains aureal. It expressed itself in sound, and the culture was tuned for it. Shakespeare and others would not have written the way they did had the audience not been able to understand. Okay? And touching the, touching the English, this is touching Englishness to the quick. The play was the very soul of the English Renaissance. And to ignore the development of the theater, folks, is to ignore the spirit of the age. The powerful linguistic tide swept everyone up, and it saturated the culture. And in the years between 1584 and 1623, in a hardly more than a single generation, more than 50 million people passed through the doors of English theaters. Okay? The translators that translate the King James Bible, they are born, they are reared in that literary culture. That is, that they are a product of their age. Okay? They know about the theater. They know about the intricacies. They know about the, 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 how the, the English language is capable of, of, of producing the, the heights of spoken prose because they've been exposed to it. And the King James translators were steeped in this Elizabethan aesthetic, the powerful linguistic vitality, the Hamletized soul of the age, if you will, that was characterized by penetrating high-velocity wit and melancholy that spun forth the finest lies that have ever been written in, in, in language ever. Okay? The King James translators are a product of that culture. They're a product of that society and history. The translators were all Elizabethans, all passionately literate, 
The aesthetic could only enhance the beauty and magnificence that was already found in the folds and pages of Scripture. It had a, they had the ability to make the beautiful more beautiful. And the Elizabethan aesthetic was the filter through which the King James translators tested every word. And it was a literary spirit that governed the culture, a spirit of word, a profoundly English spirit that risen and drove this English language to its zenith through these gods. I want you to think about this. Do you know that the plays of William Shakespeare were never published during his own lifetime? You want to know why? Because they were not meant for you to take them and sit off in a corner and study them on your own. They were meant to be heard. They were meant to be heard. They were meant to be acted out and on display and for the people to what? Hear, Hear them. Go pick up, go look at that 1611 over there. Look at the preface. Read it. You know what it says? You know what the King James translator said? They said that they produced the Bible to be what? Heard. heard. To be read in what? In public. So their attitude about, you ever hear a modern version read and you're like, that doesn't even sound like the Bible? Well, the King James translators knew that the Bible needed to sound like the Bible. And they were reared in a culture and a society where that type of public oratory was the pinnacle of, of, of artistic achievement. And so when they set out to translate, they do so in a way and in a fashion and in a form to produce this. The plays, let me read it from my notes. The plays of William Shakespeare were never written to be read or worse, studied. So there goes your high school English class. <laughs> he did not publish his plays in his own lifetime. And the King James Bible was appointed to be read in the churches. And how many of you have ever heard of, I'm a, hopefully somebody can correct me, John um, Boyce. You heard John Boyce. Maybe not. The last stage, folks, in the preparation of the King James Bible, you know what it was? It was an auditory review. They, somebody stood up. The other guy sat there with their books. And they read it out loud. And if something didn't sound right, somebody said, I got an issue with that. They made a note of it, and they would discuss it. And they translate the entire thing from the standpoint of how it would walk. And so when they make decisions to use extended verb endings, to use old archaic forms that are already going out of usage, they're doing it because they are after a certain effect. Okay? Now... John Boyce records in his notes from the final review committee that in the final step, no man read from the tra one man read from the translation, I'm sorry, and others sat around and listened, and it was an auditory review, and it was an auditory enterprise. Let me give you an example here. I got a couple of them. Andrew Downs, this is what he read. Jesus Christ. Yesterday and today, the same and forever. <clears throat> that was what they originally had in the translation before this auditory review. Now that doesn't sound as good as Jesus Christ, the same, yesterday and today and forever. You see how they wordsmith that? Let me give you a few more examples here. I'm going to read you some stuff. Man, I'll tell you what, the 400-year anniversary of the King James Bible, there are some awesome books out there in commemorating this. And uh, this is one of a majesty, the king behind the King James Bible. I want to just uh, share with you a couple things out of this regarding what I'm talking to you about. Okay? Uh, listen, these are, these are some examples here. This is Hebrews 111. This is what they originally had before this auditory review. Faith is a most sure warrant of things, is being uh, is a being of things hoped for, a discovery, a demonstration of things that are not seen. That's what they had before this auditory review. This is what they settled on. 
Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. You see the difference? It flows. It flows. It flows off the tongue. It rolls into your ear. And you say, wow. First, this is 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 11. This is what they originally had. I understood. I cared as a child. I had a child's mind. This is what they settled on. When I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I fought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. You see the difference? So these guys are a product of their age. They are a product of their culture. They are a product of, of, of an entire stream that has gone on. Let me show you another thing. Tyndale. This is uh, this, this is um, this the one I want. Yeah, First Peter chapter one verse twenty three. Tyndale said, "But the word of God, which liveth and lasteth forever." That's what Tyndale had for 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23. The Geneva had, but the word of God, who liveth and endureth forever. The King James translator settled on the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. Do you see how the extended verb ending there creates the effect of rhyme and rhythm and meter? And it enters your ear, and it sounds majestic. It sounds majestic. That's right. It sounds like the Bible. It sounds like it should sound. One of the major factors, folks, that led to the retention of archaic forms stems from the literary views of the translators themselves. Leland Rakin, author of this book right here, The Legacy of the King James Bible, celebrating 400 years of the most influential English translation. If you would, go with me to uh, 1 Corinthians 13 quick. 1 Corinthians 13. I'm going to get a full of books up here in a second, but 1 Corinthians 13. Now, I didn't have time. I should have put this up in, the, uh, in a modern version so that you could compare it, but uh, 1 Corinthians 13. Just real, I just want you, I'm going to read it. I just want you to, to listen to it, okay? And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. Charity suffereth long, and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up. Doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil. Is there a rhyme and a meter to that? Absolutely. Okay. Leland Rankin states the following. The passage flows in a weave-like cadence with the rise and fall of sound. The passage also shows how the accentuated verb ending F, okay, that I've been talking about, keep the rhythm flowing smoothly. Robbed of these verb endings, modern translations bump along in a staccato fashion. <laughs> Literary forms and features. Oh, see, I got all ahead of myself here. Literary forms and features. Another factor to consider is that the King James translators tried to reproduce the Hebrew and Greek texts as literally as possible in English. Therefore, many of the features modern readers find strange are not Renaissance or Elizabethan traits at all. They're Hebrew and Greek traits. They made a literal word-for-word -word translation. And so when, they, so when you have the original language there, and you bring that forth into English into the receptor language, because they had the philosophy that they had in translating, they literally grab and collect things out of the original languages and deposit them into English. Okay? Look at this. Uh, one of the features that slides right by us as a modern reader relates... To the genitive or possessive construction. A common biblical formula is the construction of noun plus the preposition of plus noun. Or we can subshorten that to noun plus of plus a noun. The standard English way of achieving the same effect is to turn the second noun into a modifying adjective and place in front of the first noun. Who are we talking about? Look at the examples here. <laughs> Genesis chapter 1, verse 24. The King James says, beasts of the earth. Uh -oh. 
Yeah. Beast of the earth, I'm sorry. Yeah. The way you would say that in modern English is what? Yeah. Land animal. So you see the use of of. Psalm 2 9, rod of iron. We would just say iron rod. Isaiah 5 22, men of strength, strong men. What they're doing there, folks, is because of their commitment to a literal translation, they're bringing, they're gathering these things out of Hebrew and Greek, and they're depositing them for you into your English Bible. Okay? So you have these ways and these forms of speaking. A subcategory of the noun plus of plus noun construction occurs when the same noun appears on both halves of the formula. Okay? This has the effect of, a of, of the most heightened form that could be imagined. Look at the examples here. King of what? Kings. Kings. Lord of what? Lord. Lords. Can you get any better than that? Can you get any majestic than that? Um, uh, song of songs. Uh, vanity of vanities. So these forms are brought in because of their commitment to a... To, to a particular uh, translation philosophy. Even when the noun of noun formula does not meet the specific conditions noted in the preceding paragraphs, it is simply a common formula in the King James Bible. Here, we don't have time to look at these verses, so we're just going to go with that. You look these all up at home, okay? Psalm 34, 7. Angel of the Lord. Okay? River of God. The bread, the bread of wickedness. Okay? All of these things are fascinating to consider. Once alerted to the noun of noun construction, once alerted to it, we can find it nearly continuously in the King James Bible, in addition to preserve... See, wow, that is significant because you know what it does? It preserves the word order of the original. It literally takes it out of the original language and deposits it for you in English, the receptor language, in the same word order that it appeared in the manuscript that they translated from. Amen. Now, another formula that is vintage King James are words like, lo and behold. The grammatical term for this is an interjection. The function of the formula is to single the spectacular nature of an event or to produce the importance or, or the profound importance of a statement. The effect of it is awe-inspired. Look at these examples. Behold, I stand at the door and what? Knock. All right? Behold, the angel of the Lord came upon him. What is it? When they say behold, what's it doing? It's saying, hey, you better listen to this. It's calling your ear to give attention. Same thing, we could have, I could have included, verily, verily. Yeah. Okay? These are all things that are coming out of this. Now, did your English teacher ever tell you never to begin a sentence with the word and? Yes. Come with me to Judges chapter 3. Come with me to Judges chapter 3. Judges chapter 3, verse 21. While you're finding that, I want to read you that statement there. Did your, your English teacher told you not to use the word start a sentence with the word and. It so happens that the ancient Hebrews and Greeks actually, absolutely loved the conjunction translated as and. The Hebrew word, I'm not going to try to pronounce it, uh, has the meaning, has this meaning, and in Greek the word is chi, the effect of this frequent of these of these fre the frequency of this in the King James Bible is to create a tremendous sense of continuity. Everything flows in sequence. The construction often shows a sense of cause and effect and of one thing proceeding to the next. Judges chapter 3, look at verse 21. And he who had put forth his left hand and took the dagger from his right thigh and thrust it into his belly. And the, the, the haft also went in after the blade, and the fat closed upon the blade, so that, it, so that he could not draw the dagger out of his belly, and the dirt what? Came <laughs> but you see how the, the, the repetitious use of the word and creates an understanding, and a flow, and an effect to understand what it's saying. Now that's all coming out, that's all coming into English, the receptor language, because of their abilities to understand to, in their literal translation philosophy and their ability to do that. 
Okay? Now, one of the results, folks, <clears throat> that the most uh, fundamental factor is the willingness to accept the use of verbal... English is a fascinating thing, okay? I'm going to have to summarize this point because it'll take too long. One of the results of this important decision for a little translation is a significant number of essentially Hebrew ways of speaking that became incorporated into English. This approach to translation resulted in the receptor language being enriched by idioms drawn from the donor language. Look at this. To lick the dust. To fall flat on his face. A man after his own heart. Um, this is skipping a few of these. Under the sun. Sour grapes. From time to time. Pride goes before a fall. These are all idioms and speech patterns that are found in the Hebrew. And because they literally translate the Hebrew into English, they take the Hebrew idiom out of Hebrew and give it to us as English-speaking people. And then because of the influence of the King James Bible, for the last 400 years, when people speak in these forms, what they're really doing is using Hebrew figures of speech, and they don't even know it. Okay? Because of what is going on here and how they did this. Idioms used from Tyndale. A comparison of the King James Bible with the Geneva Bible suggests that the King's translators were much more likely to retain the Hebrew word, word order or structure. Even when this resulted in a reading that did not sound quite right to English ears at the time. The passage of time increased the exposure of their translation has eliminated any awareness of the initial strangeness that led, that may have been there, and these things have now become adopted as standard English ways of speaking. Okay? Another reason why the King James readers, re, I'm sorry, reads as it does, is because of the specific instructions given. They were supposed to start, if you read the rules of the translation, they were supposed to start with the Bishop's Bible as their fundamental text. Okay? Only, according to the statistics I found, only 8% of the King James Bible is the Bishop's Bible. In contrast, they were also told then that if they didn't like the reading of the Bishop's Bible, that they should consult... Tyndale and my Cloverdale and the Great Bible and the Bishop's Bible and the Geneva Bible, okay? They should consult those and, and see if any of those readings work better. And if they work better, they should bring that reading forward. According to the statistics I have here, according to this guy right here, David Teams, okay? He says, in contrast, estimates vary, some as low as 76% and some as high as 94%. But the general consensus among historians, biblical scholars, and biographers is that William Tyndale is responsible for 90% of the King James text. Okay? And so all of these idioms are words that first appeared in Tyndale. And so because the King James translators moved, brought those forward into the 1611... And because the 1611 gained its position of predominance within the English-speaking world, he, the King James Bible brings all those things forward. Some of these words Tyndale in, literally invents. Right. They didn't exist in English, like Passover, Jehovah, scapegoat, atonement, and so forth. Okay? This Bible, folks, is a, is, it's, a, it's the summit. It is the pinnacle of written English. Because of how it brings these things forward. And I see I move into the front, so that means I better get to the end here. In the prologue to his 2000... This is fascinating, okay? I got another book here, okay? This book is called Begat. The King James Bible in the English Language. What this guy does is he, 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 go, he tracks back to find out exactly how many idioms or figures of speech the King James Bible is responsible for. In modern English. And then he takes it and he goes a step further and he tracks it back through the preceding English translations to figure out in which translation did that idiom first appear. Wow. 
And then he gives you a total at the end, and he shows you how the King James, how many of these idioms were brought forward from previous translations and then popularized by the King James Bible. These books are great. You've got to look at them. I'll, have, I'll set them out here on the table if you want to look at them. They're not for sale, though, because they matter to me quite a bit. <laughs> after, condu after conducting, listen to this, after conducting a systematic study of the King James Bible, Crystal concluded that there are 257 idioms in modern usage that were popularized by the King James Bible. No other piece of written English prose can make that claim of influence. <laughs> now I'm getting to my conclusion here. Keep going. I got some duct tape left. We can take care of that. The, <laughs> the King James Bible, listen to me. The King James Bible, folks, was published within a window of opportunity, which allowed it to exercise a substantial and decisive influence over the shaping of the English language. It was no accident that the two literary sources most identified as defining influences over English, the King James Bible and the works of William Shakespeare, both date from the same historical time period. There was virtually universal agreement in the 19th and early 20th century that the King James Bible made a massive contribution to the development of the English language in general and English prose in particular. Yet there is no evidence that the translators of the King James Bible had any great interest in, in, in matter of literature or linguistic development. Their concern was primarily to provide an accurate translation of the Bible on the assumption that accuracy was itself the most aesthetic of qualities to be desired. They didn't, set, they didn't sit down and say, okay, we're going to make the best Bible ever. They sat down and said, we're going to make the best literal translation of the Bible. And in doing that, and in bringing all these things that we've been talking about into the translation, the result was greatness. Amen. Greatness. The King James Bible is both, this is Adam Nicholson now, from God's Secretaries. Listen to this. You've got just a few more points, please. <laughs> the King James Bible is both simple and majestic. Adam Nicholson, author of God's Secretaries, writes, One of the King James Bible's most consistent driving forces is the idea of majesty. Its method and its voice are regal. Its archaic formulations, its consistent attention to a grand and heaven heavenly musical rhythm are the vehicles by which the majesty is infused into the body of the text. Its qualities are those of grace, stateliness, scale, and power. There is no desire here to please, only a belief in the norm, enormous, overwhelming divine authority. <clears throat> These people that want to promote the modern versions, I'm glad my Bible doesn't sound like the newspaper. Amen. <laughs> because if a Bible... If the, Bible, if the Bible sounded like the newspaper, it would come in one ear and go yeah. right out the other. They, they translated, they made their translation with the view to do it literally and to produce a stately effect. Amen. In conclusion, Leland Rankin in this book, this will be my last couple points. <laughs> <laughs> author of the legacy of the King James Bible chronicles the following results of the ascendancy of modern versions listen first we have lost a common English Bible in both the church and culture at large with the supplanting of the King James Bible by modern translations a common English Bible has been lost This is an incalculable loss. On numerous fronts, life was greatly simplified when virtually everyone agreed on what the Bible meant. That's right. Conversely, many things became problematic when the agreement ceased and some things were permanently lost. I guess I should put that up there for you. Second, the authority of this is, you got to listen to this. The authority of the Bible went into eclipse when we lost the common Bible. 
Probably this was inevitable. I don't agree with that. But we do need to explore the logic of that line of thought here. In fact, that the English Bible is no longer accepted as an authoritative book in public squares. That, uh, that has been explored in this book. Religion, education, law, politics, and the arts, even when modern literary authors refer to the Bible, they usually do so in a manner that challenges the intended meanings of the biblical authors. So what have we lost? We've lost the common English Bible, number one. Number two, we've, the authority of the Bible has gone into decline by these modern Number three, Biblical literacy has accompanied the decline of the King James Bible. Now listen to me. If these modern versions are being sold and marketed under the, the, the pretense that they're going to make the body of Christ more biblically astute, they're an utter abysmal failure. Right. Because the body of Christ is not more biblically literate, is not more biblically astute. They're a bunch of lazy, thumb-sucking Christians Amen. who want everything spoon-fed to them on a platter and don't want to study anything. Amen. Okay, now I'm getting upset. <laughs> This was widely acknowledged when a colleague in my own department learned that I was writing a book on the King James Bible and its legacy. She volunteered the observation that after the King James Bible gave way to a proliferation of modern translations, even Christian students became inept at seeing biblical references in literature. And the last point. What has been lost? Claims that modern translations and Bible scholars, that Christian public is fortunate to have been delivered from the archaisms and occasional, uh, the archaism, sorry, the King James Bible, turn out to be hollow. If Bible knowledge in our day has declined across the board, where is it alleged? Where is the alleged gain of modern translations? The proliferation of translations has discouraged the Christian public from seeking to know what the Bible actually says. What has been lost? A common English Bible. A nearly universal reverence for the Bible as an authoritative book and biblical literacy. Finally, we have lost the effective and literary power of the King James Bible. Not in an absolute sense as much, but the King James Bible is the pinnacle of written English. Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for your work. We are grateful for the saints that have patiently listened and gathered here. And we pray that there be edification for having looked at these things. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen.